folks, this is Tom Mullen. So we're just gonna, I'm gonna wait just a, a little bit in case anybody's signing in at the last minute. All righty. Well, folks, I'd like to uh, welcome you all to our November Learn, Discover, Grow series. My name is Tom Mullen, and I'm the executive director of the Herring Gut Learning Center in Port Clyde, Maine. I'd like to welcome you all to it. And I'm, I am so pleased to uh, share with you uh, three brand new staff members here at Herring Gut Learning Center. But I should note that is, this is a real, the technology uh, for these types of Zoom meetings allows me to jump in at the beginning because I'm actually in Palm Springs, California right now, where I have to tell you, it got a little chilly this morning. It was like, I think it was like 65 degrees this morning. Oh, when I woke up. It's tough life, but I'm at the National Conference of the National Association for Interpretation one of the several different types of professional organizations that the educators at Herring Gut and other environmental learning centers participate in. And I'm, I'm joined at this conference with about 600 other in-person and another 500 people virtual for this conference. So I'm very pleased to be able to jump in even though I'm in California at a conference. But today though, this past, past year, we were, the board of trustees and the staff got together and said, you know, we're coming out of COVID, the pandemic, and the opportunities to grow and share the story and the mission of the organization are here. People are eager to learn more about the uh, marine and aquaculture sciences that Herring Gut has long been known for. But to do it, we needed more than just one educator in, in Patrick's uh, role at Herring Gut. And fortunately, we we're able to hire two additional amazing educators to join the team of education at Herring Gut. Leading off tonight will be uh, Patrick Burnham, our educational programs coordinator. He's been at Herring Gut just a little over a year. And his experience in marine science and aquaculture, as well as aquaponics, uh, really lend itself to the leadership of the rest of the education team, uh, Elena Zerhowski and Carrie Ann Gwinnell, just both just started in the last month. And we thought, how do we share and, and, and uh, introduce folks to uh, our two brand new educators and our new uh, educational programs coordinator? And we thought, learn, discover, grow series. So with that in mind, Patrick, can you take us and more? They'll be sharing their story and their passions about marine science and aquaculture. Uh, wonderful. Hi, everyone. Um, like Tom said, uh, my name is Patrick Burnham. I'm the Educational Programs Coordinator. I am a little bit jealous of Tom right now uh, being in Palm Springs. I know how nice it is that time of year in California because uh, I actually just moved from California last year. Uh, actually really close to where Tom is right now. So I'm kind of a little jealous, uh, but I'm so excited to be here in Maine. Uh, tomorrow is actually my uh, one year anniversary of moving back uh, to the wonderful state of Maine. Um, I did grow up here, but I spent the last couple of years uh, in California and Southern California and am back this year uh, and have been I've had an amazing time over the last year working at Herring Gut Learning Center. Um, we've had a wonderful summer and a wonderful fall and are really excited about some amazing projects that we have coming down uh, the line uh, this spring and into the summer and fall and then beyond, which is really, really quite exciting. Um, so a format for tonight, uh, everyone um, that's here, we're gonna share a little bit of stories about us. Um, sorry about my email noises. So, uh, so we're gonna share some fun things about us and who we are as uh, people, as educators, as adventurers, whatever it is. We have some fun slideshows to show you with pictures and videos. Um, I would love it if anyone has any comments or questions, you can type right in the chat function of our um, Zoom meeting. Or if you want to unmute and say, hey, Patrick, I have a question. 
um, you know, please more than welcome to take those thoughts and comments because we like to interact with people. And so it's really fun to do that. So anyway, I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to uh, get going with my section of our really amazing slideshow that we made for you. Everyone, uh, the three of us had a lot of fun digging through our pictures and our um, uh, Facebooks and all the things to try and find really cool pictures to show you all tonight. So share screen. All right. Can everyone see my screen, my friends? All right, I got the thumbs up from my coworkers, which is great. Um, again, my name is Patrick Burnham, Educational Programs Coordinator. I've been with Herring Up for a year um, and have been doing outdoor marine science education uh, since 2012 uh, is really when I got started. Um, and we're kind of go through the history of my uh, career in this and you know yeah so for those who are away um or are from away here that are not from maine um i grew up in gardner you can see in that map right up there it's the red star it's just, you know 45 minutes north of portland it's off of the coast a little bit uh just south of our capital augusta in the great state of maine um growing up there was really cool because we didn't live necessarily next to the ocean, but we lived close enough to the ocean to go and adventure and do lots of fun things. Um, the pictures here kind of showcase some of my favorite places uh, in Maine that I have uh, had the you know wonderful privilege to go and visit. Um, the top one with the tent right there is my favorite campground in all of um, uh, Southern Maine area. It's a Hermit Island campground in Phippsburg, um, small point really great fantastic um would go there every year with my family and it was a lot of fun and then there's the long beach down there is reed state park another really fantastic state park uh here in maine um that is um kind of like on the next peninsula over from um Phippsburg. it's like an hour drive from Phippsburg if you're driving up and then down the peninsula again um but it's just across the way if you're going by boat but it's another really great place um that i found myself a lot and the last picture is uh of acadia national park um a quintessential down east maine area and i really enjoy down east maine um and how just raw and beautiful and how the forest meets the ocean. It's just fantastic. So that's kind of like why I love Maine so much. And I'm so excited to be back here to teach about, you know, Maine, everything, um, kind of that little history. Oh, and then there's tide pooling up in the quarter, corner because I really quite enjoy tide pooling, which is really fun. Um, if you've been to any of our summer programs where we do tide pooling, you know that I like tide pooling a lot. Uh, Great. So my kind of start um, with marine science, I have to kind of give a little nod to um, my probably my closest uh, family member, my grandmother. Um, she, these are a couple of pictures, uh, kind of recent pictures. Um, the one with the tortoise is we took a trip to the Galapagos together. Um, my grandmother, um, was just like I want to go to the Galapagos let's go and we're like okay so we went um the other picture is from Bonaire her favorite place a really great snorkeling place she's uh really my kind of inspiration and the catalyst to a lot of my marine science work um she always gave me the chance um to go experience outside uh nature marine science all the things um she would bring me to the ocean she would um, bring me to the seashores and experience a bunch of different things all up and down the east coast um, so we shared a lot of uh, have shared a lot of um, adventures together and i hope to in the future there's some more pictures of us um, 
She's in the middle right there in the Galapagos with a sea lion. Um, she's holding an octopus while we're snorkeling together. I got her into our kids' wetsuits, which I thought were really fun where I used to work. Um, and then at the Harry Potter world down in Orlando. Uh, so we've done a lot of things. She also um, got me into photography. You'll see a lot of the pictures that I've taken in the past. So she's really the kind of the problem for the most expensive two hobbies that I have, which is photography and uh, snorkeling and diving. So thank you, um, Rachi, when you see this recording, appreciate it. Um, after growing up and getting kind of hooked on marine science, I went to the University of New England. Um, my degree is in marine uh, science with environmental studies uh, minor. These are a couple of really fun field works that we used to do um, going out and collecting inverts and starting my love of tide pooling and, you know, being out in the mud looking for uh, really fun critters. These are all up from the down east uh, Cobbs Cook Bay area in Lubeck, really cool amounts of critters. And where it kind of solidified my, my love for marine science and also my not so great love for doing research um, in a lab. This is kind of the point where I knew like I liked marine science, but I liked communicating and telling people about marine science rather than staying in a lab doing research. Um, so I made a kind of shift and stayed with marine science, but started to do more education things. Um, and that led me to the Maine State Aquarium. Uh, down in Booth Bay, uh, which hopefully will be open again this year. If you ever come and visit the state of Maine in the summertime, you must go to the Booth Bay Aquarium, the Maine State Aquarium. They are wonderful. Um, and I spent a lot of summers volunteering there. And then uh, as an educator there, don't look at how the old picture of me in the middle. I apologize for everyone. Um, that was a long time ago. And then this is a really cool picture of me. I'll divert everyone's eyes to the giant lobster that I'm holding. Um, Colossus is like a 26 pound lobster that the Maine State Aquarium had one year. So love the Maine State Aquarium. Uh, had a lot of great experiences educating there, learning, you know, about fishing industries in Maine and a lot of that other stuff, but then kind of honing my skills of communication um, of that or interpretation outwards of that information. And that led me to uh, my next job, um, which I moved to California and worked at this place called Fox Landing, um, uh, the Catalina Island Marine Institute. It's uh, on Catalina Island off of Southern California. Really quite an amazing place. I can't ever say enough about um, how wonderful of an organization um, CIMI is. Uh, California requires all middle school students to do some kind of overnight adventure camp for their schooling. And we provided five uh, five days, four nights, or three days, two nights, uh, overnight camps for students from all over the world. We had students from Georgia and Tennessee, uh, Colorado, Montana, but mostly, you know, from California. Um, and their whole motto was education through exploration. And I've kind of brought that with me um, to hair and gut as well. And I will carry it with me for a long time. Some quick, quick pictures. This is me teaching a shark lab. Um, uh, some of these pictures are going to be kind of goofy and kind of fun, but that's kind of what, who I am and, you know, what kind of an educator has been shaped through, um, working with CME. So this is me teaching a shark lab to a bunch of students. That's a shark jaw right there, which is really cool. It was a bull shark jaw. Um, we took kids snorkeling, uh, which was amazing. And, you know, most of the time, there was a lot more fixing of gear than there was snorkeling, but that's okay. Um, a lot of the students had never been in the ocean before that we uh, got, even though they were living in LA and they were uh, two miles from the ocean, they had never actually been or seen or knew that there were things under the ocean. Um, so when they got those goggles on and got into the water and they were like, I didn't know that there were fish under the water and they were right there. It was just, you know, some of the most magical things in the whole world. Um, so we got to take them snorkeling, doing fun things. Um, this is me catching a uh, shovel nose guitar fish. It's kind of like a skate, um, a ray type animal that doesn't have a barb, which is really cool. And 
you know, this is the, the, the magic um, that outdoor education can really show and uh, give to students. Um, and being able to share that with kiddos is really great. Um, it kind of, or it didn't kind of, it did shape my kind of philosophy that I have in my education um, in that funds hand, fun, hands-on experiences provide moments of wonder that lead to meaningful learning. And I think that that's really important is we have to get kids outside or we have to get them doing something hands-on and it has to be fun because if they're having fun and they have that like moment that clicks for them of wonder and excitement, then learning is going to be secondary, but it's going to be natural and it's going to be easy. And it's our, our learning is going to be secondary and natural and learn, you know, happening as they're having fun. And it just reinforces that, you know, really amazing experience. So this is us tonight snorkeling. Um, really cool. Oh, yes. Sometimes we had to do crazy things and this is uh, a couple of coworkers of mine um, and the water was really terrible that day and we had zero visibility, really choppy, really gross water. So we had to make it fun. So we did war paint and we colored the kids like great. And now all the kids look like this. We look like this. And then we went and jumped in the water and just played around on the waves. And so we had to adapt to a lot of really cool things. We also got to do um, some fun um, dressing up and presenting the material in a fun way for kids. This is uh, Sparkles the Merman. And uh, I was teaching the kids how to put on their wetsuits. Not in this picture, but it eventually got to a point where I was teaching them how to um, put on their wetsuits because wetsuits can be daunting sometimes for students. Some other cool pictures, I'll go quickly because I have been talking for a long time. These are some octopus that we found, my favorite animal. That's why I put them in here because I think they're so brilliant and amazing. And one of the fun things we got to see out in California is actually catch and hold these octopus. Um, a very similar species to what the octopus, um, that movie from Netflix, um, my octopus teacher. Um, so, really cool. I felt that movie in my heart sometimes, which is really fun. And I don't know if any of these are going to work, but um, this is catching an octopus, bringing some movies into your evening, which is really great. Um, and doing it with kids and having them have that wonder of like, oh my goodness, I'm holding an octopus like I only see these things in National Geographic I can't believe they're right here that's just part of the things that are um, quite amazing oh come on go to the next one um scuba diving my other passion um that I really love this is scuba diving with some uh sea lions California sea lions um Let's see if this video comes in. Of diving. We don't need the voices or the noises of my bubbles. Um, but this is some of the cool things that, you know, shaped me as a person who loves science and loves ocean. And that's why I wanted to share it with you all tonight. Um, so you can kind of see that's my friend, I'm like twirling and swirling with the sea lion because they would sometimes mimic and do the same things. Um, really fun, really playful uh, creatures. Come on. Some more diving. Um, we got to see some cool things like uh, swimming through kelp, which the kelp in California is a lot bigger than the kelp here in Maine, even though the kelp in Maine is really important. The kelp here, Macrocystis pyphiria, um, is massive, can grow uh, three feet in a day in the right uh, conditions, which is amazing. And it makes these beautiful canopy forests that are just um, incredible. Gonna move a little bit faster. And then sometimes you see some cool animals like giant black sea bass, which are these 300 pound fish that are absolutely just 
incredible and endangered and really fun in the water. Um, they seem like you could, they could swallow your whole hand, but uh, they're just dental giants and they like to just eat crabs and not be bothered. Really fun. And then I want to kind of end with um, this quote because it kind of circles back to the whole theme of tonight's event, like why aquatic science? Um, and I pulling back my original philosophy of, you know, fun, hands-on moments of wonder uh, cause for or allow for meaningful learning. If I take that philosophy, then really in my mind, the only thing that truly captures that much wonder all the time is the ocean and is water. Um, whether it's a lake, a river, the ocean, a stream, a bog, it doesn't matter if it's water. I think, you know, those things really create those moments of wonder and really amazing learning. So for me, the ocean is really connected to that. And the sea, once it casts its spell, holds one of its net of one, one holds one in its net of wonder forever. Um, so that's why I chose, you know, aquatic science and why I'm here, because I think it's the best tool to really educate our youth in a meaningful way and not just youth communities in a meaningful way. So that's my slideshow. Um, and I'm going to stop sharing and I hope that wasn't too terrible. And Oh, good. Everyone is still here. No one left. <laughs> so, um, I'm going to pass, uh, the torch off now to, um, my uh, coworker, uh, Carrie Ann, um, and she's going to introduce herself. So take it away. All right. Let me share my screen here. One second. Present. All right. We should be up. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Carrie Ann Gwinnell. I am an aquatic science aquaculture educator for the Herring Gut Learning Center. Um, and as, as Tom and, and Patrick and everyone has mentioned, I'm here tonight to show you um, sort of my journey of, um, you know, why aquatic science, um, how, I, how I got to Herring Gut Learning Center and, and why I'm doing what I'm doing. Um, I'm originally from New Jersey. Um, New Jersey sometimes gets a bad rap, um, but I um, need to just give a shout out to the Jersey Shore um, because I think that's really where I fell in love uh, with, with the ocean. Um, I have very specific memories of um, being a little girl and my dad taking me to the shore where the waves are crashing and digging in the sand for mole crabs. Um, and just that simple activity, you know, really just blew my mind that there were animals, there were crabs living in the sand. Um, that, you know, was my first, uh, one of my first memories of just uh, being in awe of, of ocean animals and, and ocean life. Um, so, included this picture here. Um, this is actually not at the Jersey shore, but it, it's in my, uh, my grandma's backyard at her, her pool. Um, and I think that as a little girl, um, you know, I, I first wanted to be a, a dolphin trainer. Um, but I think people, um, in this field quickly realize that, um, there's, there's a lot more, um, to marine science than, um, you know, charismatic megafauna, um, big mammals like dolphins, um, even though they are really fun and really great um, animals. Um, so it's not really um, a mistake that I ended up here in Maine um, every summer, uh, probably from fourth grade, she's through through college, um, I spent in Maine. Um, my my parents really um, enjoyed Rangeley, Maine, which is in the the Western Mountains. Um, and I, it's a joke now in my family that I'm the one living in Maine because every summer, while Maine is beautiful, 
Um, I really, as a kid, wanted to explore the rest of the country um, and the rest of the world, but we, we always ended up in Maine. Um, and so my family really thinks it's hilarious now that I'm the one living in Maine, but I have to say that, um, you know, my love of nature and of aquatic science and the environment really um, comes from some of the experiences that I had here in Maine um, and that I had with my family. Um, my, my parents were not the type to take us to an amusement park. They took us camping and they took us canoeing and kayaking and hiking. Um, so, so really my love of the environment and, and of the ocean really um, comes from my parents. Um, so as I got older and realized um, that I wanted to be a marine biologist, I went to the University of Rhode Island, which is appropriately in the ocean state. Um, and I majored in marine biology and minored in marine affairs. Um, and uh, one summer while I was at the University of Rhode Island, um, I interned at Jenkinson's Aquarium, which is actually a small aquarium in New Jersey on the boardwalk. Um, that's me there with Coral, the harbor seal. Um, and one of my jobs there as an intern was to talk to summer camp groups and other childcare groups that would come in um, and we would visit each exhibit and talk to them about the animals that were living there, the habitats they lived in, the adaptations they had to allow them to live in those environments. Um, and then um, you'll see over on the, the right hand side of the screen um, is the Bermuda Institute of Ocean Sciences sign. Um, while I was at the University of Rhode Island, I spent a semester in Bermuda, which was really just incredible. Um, and I had so many hands on experiences there um, that really shaped, um, shaped my career path. Um, as an educator. Um, this is me diving. Um, I was certified as a scientific diver um, while I was in Bermuda um, and we studied coral reef ecology um, and marine invertebrate um, zoology while I was there. And, you know, as soon as I got under the water there um, and saw the coral um, for the first time and saw the, the life that was there, um, you know, was again one of these moments where I was just in awe. Um, Patrick mentioned earlier, you know, this is the octopus that the kids, that he was showing the kids, you know, the kids thought, oh, well, I've only seen this on TV. Um, this was that moment for me. I've only saw coral like that on television. Um, so to have that um, hands-on experience was, was really just, just incredible. Um, did some research um, while I was there. Um, so I studied um, the variegated sea urchin and um, the success rate of fertilization based on light conditions um, while I was there. Um, and then um, the coral on the right is actually went with a professor from the University of Rhode Island um, to the British Virgin Islands. We went to a small private island called Guana. Um, and we planted coral. Um, so we collected uh, fragments of Acropora palmata, the elkhorn coral, and we transplanted them. They were already broken off from the reef um, through storms and other natural occurrences. We collected them and we actually just zip tied them um, to one common area. And we were looking at um, the genetic and environmental influences um, that the growth of corals had and how that influenced their restoration success. Um, but we were basically gardening under the water, which um, was, was really cool. Um, and then um, I actually have a, a nod in a, in a paper um, that, that was published um, from that research um, in the Journal of Marine Ecology. Um, and then I also presented um, some of that research at a benthic ecology conference um, in Mobile, Alabama. Um, but like Patrick um, realized that he did not, um, research was not for him. I, I, you know, it's, it's no coincidence that we kind of found the similar path where research was just not it for me. And um, something that we did in 
uh, while in Guano was we had a kids week actually. Um, and I was teaching kids about coral disease while snorkeling. And, you know, there was this eight-year-old who was just so excited and she was so, um, you know, disheartened by the corals that were bleaching or, or had a disease. And I knew right then and there that, um, you know, I needed to teach kids about, about marine science and, and why it's important. And so shortly after I graduated the University of Rhode Island, I moved to South Carolina. Um, I took a three month position as a marine science instructor. So we taught kids um, about crabbing and cast sending in the intracoastal waterway. We talked to them about blue crab anatomy um, and their life behaviors. Um, we talked to them, we took them in the salt marsh um, and it was really fun to watch a child's face change as they saw the salt marsh come alive. So we talked to them about the productivity that that ecosystem has, the importance of Spartina alterniflora, the salt marsh cord grass. We talked to them about fiddler crab populations and the estimated fiddler crab populations. Um, and um, one great thing that we did during their trip. Um, so we do we did ran school programs and summer camp programs. Um, so kids stayed for three days, two day, three days and two nights during the school year. Um, and then they stayed for a whole week during summer camp. Um, but we took them out to a barrier island called Capers Island, just north uh, south of the Caper Maine National Wildlife Refuge, which was set up to protect migratory birds. Um, but when we took them to the island, we explored what's called a boneyard beach. And for those of you who do not know what a boneyard beach is, um, it's that picture there on the left. Um, basically, the maritime forest um, is becomes petrified as the ocean kind of encroaches on the land um, as the sand um, erodes away and is carried away um, by the longshore current. Um, so we took the kids to the barrier island and we ran transects, um, set up quadrats, and talked to them about the different invertebrates um, that inhabit that island um, in South Carolina. Um, along the way, um, we often went birding um, and I became quite passionate about birds. Um, so that's actually me standing on um, our Carolina skiff with a group of teachers. So sometimes we did professional development as well. Um, so this was a master naturalist teacher class that I took out um, on the intercoastal waterway um, and we went birding and you can see at the bottom picture, that's just one dock um, and it's just filled with um, a diverse group of, of birds, willets and um, dowagers. Um, so that was um, just really uh, incredible to see and to, to be able to share um, such a pristine environment um, with kids and adults alike. Um, so I mentioned that I took a three month position. Um, I actually ended up staying there for, for eight years. So I went from marine science instructor to summer camp counselor, became the assistant director, um, and then eventually I became the director of the um, 72 bed facility. Um, so training staff, uh, running camp programs um, throughout the year. And, um, you know, I, I really just um, really shaped my career and a lot of my um, philosophies on outdoor education. Um, from there, I moved to Cape Cod. I briefly worked for uh, Mass Audubon. Um, at the Wellfleet Bay Wildlife Sanctuary. Um, unfortunately, the, the pandemic had some different plans for me, uh, and I began working at the Cape Cod Maritime Museum, um, and I created the, I helped to create the Young Mariner Program, um, and this was uh, a really great challenge for me because I was basically creating a camp program from scratch. Um, so this, this program um, is near and dear to my heart because it provided access to water and to the ocean um, and outdoor experiences for kids who maybe never had that experience. Um, even though these kids were live on Cape Cod, um, many of them uh, were able to receive a full scholarship um, and many of them 
never really had access to the water. Um, their parents, you know, were busy working and didn't um, have the ability to take them to the beach, um, even though the beach could be at the end of their street. Um, so that was really important to me to share these experiences with kids. And just as, you know, my parents had um, given me hands-on experiences, I wanted to be able to provide that um, for, for kids whose parents maybe couldn't. Um, and so uh, we talked to the kids about how to navigate uh, using, using a chart. The program took place on Lewis Bay. And so we left out of Hyannis Harbor uh, which was right behind the Cape Cod uh, Maritime Museum. Um, so we took them out on a Dyer 29 um, and talked to them about, um, you know, how to use a boat. But then we also talked to them about the environment that, um, that we were in. Um, so there's a picture from the Sweetheart Creek Oyster Farm. Um, and the oyster farmer there is um, teaching the kids about aquaculture, about his gear, um, and talk to them about why oysters are important and how they grow um, and um, you know why he was growing them um, the way that he was in that environment. Um, we also talked about different ways to grow oysters um, depending on um, the habitat that they were in. Um, and here's just some more pictures of um, me working with the kids, we were teaching them about water quality, um, you know, the water quality right there in the harbor. You can see there's tons of boats around in that picture. Um, in the inner harbor there, the water quality is not so great. Um, so just kind of talking to the students about, um, you know, why it was important to understand what was going on um, in the water there in the water that's, that's really right in their own backyard. Um, picture on the right, I got my uh, uh, residential lobster license while I was um, the camp director for the Young Mariner program. Um, so we pulled up lobster pots and talked to the students about um, gear regulations and lobster regulations in Massachusetts and why they were important. Um, and then we got to talk about all of the fun animals and their adaptations that we pulled up in the trap. And that was um, really fun. That was a new experience for me as well, pulling up, uh, setting the lobster lobster pot and then pulling it up um, were, were new experiences for me. So the first time that I did that and I did that with kids was um, was really exciting for, for both of us, um, for myself as an educator and for the, the kids as participants. Um, and then, you know, we, the title of um, this Learn, Discover, Grow series tonight is Why Aquatic Science? And, um, you know, I really love this quote from Sylvia Earle, who is one of my role models, a female marine biologist, kind of a, a pioneer a woman in marine science. Um, and she said, there's plenty of water in the universe without life, but nowhere is there life without water. Um, and I think that really shows why aquatic science is so important um, because it's a huge part of our world. It's the reason um, that we're all here uh, tonight, really. Um, it's the reason that we're all living and breathing. And so I think it's important um, for, for kids and adults alike um, to really be educated about, about water um, and why it's important in our world. Um, so with that, I am going to pass on the torch to Elena. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And Elena, you are you are up. Thank you, Carrie Ann. So I will share my screen. Is it working? Okay. All right. So I'm also an aquatic science aquaculture educator, new to herring gut. And in this picture, you'll see this one again, the middle picture, I'm doing some water sampling at 18 Mile Creek outside of Buffalo, New York. I grew up in Western New York. I've also lived in Ohio, Poland, overseas for a time teaching English. And while in college, I got to do a natural resources study abroad trip there, but I'll get to that in a moment. 
My early inspirations for majoring in environmental science with a concentration in water quality management had a lot to do with my dad and my mom taking us on lots of nature vacations, going to see lots of national parks. We're in the Great Smoky Mountains in these pictures. My sisters and my cousin, Laura, is also in that picture. And I just always like to immerse myself in the natural surroundings. So climbing the tree, going on the rocks, going in the water. I've always been drawn to water, whether it's salt water, fresh water, like Patrick said, a bog, marsh, wetland, lake, river, stream, ocean, all of it. I absolutely love. And I grew up with Niagara Falls in my backyard. So that was one of my big inspirations. I was just in such awe of this natural wonder growing up. And anytime my friends would have a friend from out of town in, we would bring them to Niagara Falls. And then Lake Erie was in my front yard growing up and the past two years living in Dunkirk, New York, I was two blocks away and would just come to this lake, take nature photography, explore the wildlife, go birding uh, just right there. And I learned about the red-breasted merganser and buffleheads for the first time there. And in the winter, I got to see these snow volcanoes over the sand and water waves would come in and just shoot water out of those which is really neat. And as I was starting to pick what to major in in college, I was thinking to myself, what have I always loved and never stopped being drawn to or being attached to? And it was water, nature, being outdoors, uh, learning about alternative energy sources and protecting our waterways. So I chose environmental science and I have a love for wetlands, AKA swamps. And one of the main reasons is because they have this incredible ability to filter water and purify watersheds. And right at Ohio State, there are two mitigated wetlands that Dr. Mitch created over 20 years ago. And you can see uh, they're in this part, they're shaped like kidneys. And they're acting as giant filters for the Olentangy River at Ohio State. And the water that's going into the wetlands is getting filtered by aquatic plants such as Arrowhead. And students are there sampling the water, testing oxygen levels, nitrogen levels, and turbidity, all kinds of parameters and recording everything, doing their research out there. And all the water that's coming out, they're finding is cleaner and has been purified by these wetlands. So they're offering outreach to farmers and a lot of farmers have created wetlands on their land to help clean water from their crops before it gets into uh, the local waterways surrounding their farmland. And here's some pictures of me taking samples from 18 Mile Creek. My advisor at Ohio State actually let me do my honors thesis research in New York and not Ohio. So I actually collected samples for somewhere between eight and 10 weeks. And then I got to freeze them all in mini nail gene bottles. So our freezers were loaded with these. And I brought them back to the lab at Ohio State and tested for nitrogen and phosphorus levels. And I was comparing urban to agricultural stations to see if a particular location contributed more of those nutrient concentrations. And I didn't find any differences based on those locations, but I did find that after a rainfall, there were higher levels of both. So there was some increase during uh, in the runoff during rain. And I also discovered that it seemed a bit solitary going out into the field sometimes and in the lab analyzing this data and writing technical reports, which I didn't mind doing, but I just wanted to do even more with it and tell more people about it. And my first internship was a day camp teaching students about farming adventures at Crown Point Ecology Center. And then I was going to do just a summer job for a couple of months as camp counselor, 
and outdoor living skills coordinator. And I ended up staying on staff at Camp Wilson for two years. So outdoor education was my foundation of education training and the style of how I like to teach, very experiential uh, with expeditions and a lot of exploring. And we had a freshwater lake, uh, a kettle lake formed by a glacier called Lake Makuchi, also known as Silver Lake at our camp. And we took the kids out there to sample macroinvertebrates, brought it back to our lab room, looked in microscopes, and they analyzed what populations of macroinvertebrates lived in there and then assess the water quality based on which ones were surviving in that water. And it did have good water quality. I got to work with the reptiles and amphibians and have kids hold those and discuss their adaptations. And then in these pictures, the three big pictures are the astronomy class. And there's a big hands-on aspect with students working in teams of up to 10 to work on a lunar cycle. And we actually had a constellation dome that was homemade by a team of naturalists at the camp. And the constellations were poked in the top and would go in there, turn off the lights, turn on our flashlight and tell stories about those. And kids just lit up learning about actual stories of constellations in the sky above them. I got to teach archery, dream team. So a lot of team building work and debriefing those and helping kids feel motivated and inspired and increase their confidence. We also had a class called Wilson Rocks about geology. We got to do some acting and be really silly presenting their cabin cleaning scores in the morning. And these students stayed for three days, two nights. We also had fishing class, horse scent, trail rides, tree identification, edible plants and fire cooking. And I just had such a blast here but I was having this desire to work with the kids more than just two and a half days. And I wanted to also get deeper into the curriculum and go to the next chapter of the subject matter. So I looked into teaching in the classroom and I went to grad school, got certified to teach in elementary ed. And at this camp, I worked mostly with grades four to six, but we worked with students as young as first grade up to ninth grade. And so I got elementary certified and I really enjoyed it. And I got to help a lot of students with science, math, English, social studies. But some of the temporary positions I had going from substitute teaching into long-term subbing into my own classroom were kind of lacking in the science side. And I just really started to miss teaching science. Like my full passion wasn't being applied. And so I began looking back into more science-y positions and outdoor education positions. And I was super ecstatic to find herring gut. And so my transition was going from a freshwater background. So from fresh to salt. And that's also the name of a big project that I'm helping herring gut develop further from fresh to salt flowing together. So helping design lessons that are going to connect middle school students from coastal Maine to inner main and just collaborate on data collection, sharing that on the web and finding out why water quality is so important and helping them get involved as stewards of clean water. But I love learning about seaweed and this is me visiting Maine this past summer in August at Popham Beach. And I learned what this strange creature was growing on top of the seaweed stem, a bryozoan, which Patrick and Carrie Ann helped me identify. And it's growing on some rockweed. And then we have sea lettuce on the right side, ovalectuca, if I'm saying that correctly. And that is me kayaking on the Kennebec River. And I completely fell in love with this river. And when I found out that fresh to salt was on the Kennebec River, the pilot year would be studying the Kennebec River. I was like, yes. So it actually gets two tidal cycles on the way to the ocean. And I think it'd be really neat to have some of the students from a more landlocked portion of Maine coming to the coast and studying it and vice versa, taking people from the coast and showing them the freshwater side of the river. 
And these were things that I fell in love with in Maine. This was the first lobster that I ate, <laughs> the whole thing of. Um, and then seagulls and any of the water birds. And I was trying to take this kind of surfer wave photograph there. I also enjoy nature photography. So I am here at Herring Gut. I got to participate in the open house. And this was this girl's first time touching sea creatures, little lobsters and, and little green crabs. And I'm sampling the water from the tilapia tanks that are part of the aquaponics system. So we, we test for the pH, nitrates, nitrates, ammonia, and make sure that those are all balanced. And one of the courses I think would be really cool to create for herring gut is inspired by my trip to Costa Rica during college. One of the things I researched there was microclimates. And I think it'd be really neat to make a transect or even make like a microcosm, uh, mini microclimate that would be influenced by different things like a rocky outcrop. How does that affect the wind speed, the temperature, uh, any of those parameters and just see if we could find any differences within the same location. Are there any microclimates that are different because of a certain factor affecting it? So does that affect what wildlife can live in that portion? So that's something I'm curious about and passionate about. And then this picture is to answer the question, am I ready for a main winter? Am I prepared? Yes. So that's me shoveling three feet of snow and uh, uncovering my mother's car back in Buffalo. <laughs> Lancaster, New York specifically there. So for me, uh, it doesn't matter what form water is in, whether it's frozen or liquid, I enjoy going out and exploring it. And I think it's super important to educate children and adults about our watersheds and wildlife and why we should preserve them. So that's part of my goal at Herring Gut and why I got into aquatic science. Thank you for listening. Elena, uh, Carrie Ann, and Patrick, thank you so much for sharing your story and your love of uh, aquatic science and aquaculture and aquaponics and just environmental education and learning in general. At this point in time, we almost, you know, wrapped up the time period we have allocated, but if anybody has any particular questions for our uh, three educators, just unmute yourself and ask it directly. Hi, this is Gary, and I can disclose my last name if you would prefer. Uh, you can be, it's up to you. All right, I'll stay anonymous <laughs> for the time being. <laughs> uh, question is, uh, you know, there was mention of, oh, I, you know, really want to do the outreach with the kids and be educators as such, outdoor education. Um, and there was mention that, oh, maybe research wasn't right for me, but in the interaction with the visitors to Herring Gut, will you still be planting little seeds to get the visitors to understand the value of research? I think if I can, you know, uh, answer that, Gary, thank you so much for your question. Um, I think some clarification, not clarification, but yes, I think that's a, a fantastic thing. And I think one of the reasons why a lot of us got into education wasn't necessarily that, you know, we didn't necessarily, you know, find that research was our thing, but communicating that research effectively was our thing. And, you know, sometimes we find that there is a slight disconnect between great scientists and communicating of their work so that everyone can understand and benefit from it instead of, you know, these, you know, scientific, you know, papers that are truly mind boggling to read, you know, we can digest and then, you know, help everyone, including, you know, students or public, whomever it is, understand a lot of that science. So I think while we don't perform that science, we are really good at communicating that science outward. Um, and I think that's a main goal of Herring Gut going forward. We're going to be looking at, 
you know, our fresh assault program that Elena talked about incorporating the latest science and the latest research in those things. And then also incorporating some more aquaculture events and activities um, in our lobster pound here at uh, Herring Gut Learning Center on our facility. Um, you know, using that research and uh, uh, the latest science to teach about the things that are there. Yeah, and, and I would like to uh, second what Patrick was saying. It's uh, uh, the skill sets that we have of the uh, education staff here at Herring Gut uh, really lends itself to taking co taking those complex scientific information that and research that takes place and translating it into a way that the general public can understand it and appreciate it and make wise decisions about it moving forward. And not just for adults, but uh, children of all ages. Well, um, at the, I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, Tom. We actually had a question that got typed in um, to our chat box. Um, so uh, other question was, um, what curricular uh, items at Herring Gut happening now slash soon are we most excited about? Um, so what are we most excited about, about what we're teaching right now? Uh, uh, Lena, how about you go first? Yes, I am excited about getting together with some St. George students next week for our early release day adventures. I know I had a lot of fun with them doing tide pooling before, and I know we'll get to do some more touch tank exploring with them and and also involve some holiday decorating, but we always get to do a variety with them in a four hour time slot. Well, wonderful. Well, Carrie Ann, what are you most excited for that's coming up? Um, I am excited um, to be putting together, helping put together um, our programming for the after school programs that will be starting um, in Thomaston. Um, in uh, January after after the holidays, so excited to to kind of put that together um, and roll that out um, with with some new students. Wonderful. How about you, Patrick? Um, thank you. I am really excited for. We have a group of students actually coming down to Herring Gut uh, in uh, January and February. Uh, a gifted and talented uh, group of students from. Uh, Oceanside Middle School, seventh and eighth grade students. And they are coming down and focusing on uh, a mini topic of plankton and the ocean drifters. And we're gonna be learning about there. I'm gonna be you know, uh, helping them uh, investigate why animals in our uh, oceans drift instead of just swim. And they're gonna culminate in this project and build a jellyfish tank. Um, from scratch and we're going to have some new jellyfish so in like three months time we're going to have um, this amazing jellyfish tank that some students are going to build um, and bringing some stem components into their learning uh, down at Herring Gut so it'd be a really fun thing to show you all if you're in the area to come stop down and see. And I'm pretty I'm really excited about the team collaborative that's taking place with the education staff as well as Sally and I in the uh, launch and rollout of our fresh assault program in the within the Kennebec River watershed, and that that'll be a really pivotal opportunity for us to uh, showcase herring gut beyond our normal uh, programmatic area. And most of all, as we sort of wrap up the evening, I just wanted to thank you all for joining us this evening, and uh, we uh, are planning a whole series of learn discover, grow programs, virtual programs for the next year, as well as a, a slew of other new community and outreach programming that's taking place in the 2022 uh, year. But one way that uh, it, I can't help but mention it, it's that time of year where organizations do uh, sort of the end of calendar year uh, appeal for uh, support. And if you'd like to learn more about how you can support Herring Gut, uh, through uh, contributions or time or uh, volunteer efforts. It would be great if you just reach out to myself or anybody on the uh, Herring Gut staff to learn more about how you can do it in the, to help support us in the coming year. I'd like to thank you all very much for coming this evening and I look forward to seeing you next month when we have our next program, Learn, Discover, Grow. Thank you.